Hi, Brian here again, and today we're in bed, so you can see. Uh, but in its current state, not going to offer a particularly good night's sleep. So, what we're doing today? Making the bed. So you can see what we have here is the actual bed frame. Now a bed, a real bed, is actually still a, a relatively high-end piece of furniture at the time. There's plenty of regular folks in English society that would have uh, you know, just had a, a pallet or a cot or just a mattress on the floor. So actually having a bed uh, to elevate your mattress and to provide that extra layer of comfort uh, is still an, an, another layer of, of luxury, you could say. It's not like it's only available in the upper classes. There's plenty of folks in the common classes that had them, but it was not seen as, as the norm and the necessary like we do today. This is a, a step up from just having something to sleep on. Uh, and it is, of course, a rope bed. So in addition to the frame, we are going to need our rope. And, uh, of course, as we get ready to start stringing the bed, <clears throat> with a rope suspended bed, you want it to be as tight, as tensioned as possible. And this will give rise to a little bit of mythology around the phrase, sleep tight. And as we begin to feed our rope through the frame here, you can see, one, this is uh, not going to be a super quick process. So while bed maintenance is certainly something that's going to happen semi-regularly, probably a lot more than we do today, you're not necessarily going to want to unrope it with frequency unless you really have to. But that phrase, sleep tight, it makes sense from a modern perspective. You know, you want to want to make sure your ropes are tight, your bed is, is well-tensioned and comfortable, not sagging out from underneath of you. Uh, but first known written instance of that phrase, sleep tight, does not actually show up until the 1860s, by which point, Spring mattresses are starting to come onto the scene. And the phrase sleep tight doesn't become popular until the turn of the 20th century, by which point rope beds are really on their way out. Spring mattresses have become the norm. And so we can see that in this instance, as much as it makes sense, and as much as we like to think that that phrase is connected to Rope beds, clearly, doesn't actually have a direct correlation. And with the research done by some modern linguists, we've had to draw the conclusion that it really simply refers to sleeping comfortably, getting a good night's sleep. There are also a few references that appear to refer to going to bed having over imbibed a little bit. Again, a turn of the century vernacular, getting good and tight, having maybe one or two, two uh, one or two too many drinks. But for the most part, again, it appears to refer to simply sleeping comfortably. Now, as we continue to work the road through here, what we're going to see is that the rope is going to first work back and forth. In this case, I started the headboard, so we're gonna go lengthwise, back and forth and back and forth. And then once we've covered the whole bed going uh, lengthwise, we'll basically turn the corner and crisscross, essentially going back and forth 
uh, across the breadth of the bed. And uh, again, you know, this is going to take some, some time. But most things in the 17th century did. By comparison to the sorts of household chores we do today, you are uh, definitely spending a lot more time on anything. An awful lot of our technological innovations over the centuries have been time savers and labor, labor savers. So we've gotten accustomed to a lot more instant gratification in most things we do, even when it comes to household chores. We'll go ahead and get this roped as quickly as we can. All right, so you can see we have now turned the corner and I'm going to now be working on pulling it the breadth of the bed. And I don't know if you can see, but what I've done is started the rope under the first, uh, or, or well, over the first of the, uh, the lengthwise ropes uh, and then work it under and over, under and over, under and over. Uh, kind of weaving it between all these ropes to help prevent uh, sag, to help prevent slide. It's all going to allow these ropes to work better together. Uh, so now we'll just keep working it back and forth, weaving it between lengthwise ropes.
Okay, so we've got the bed roped and it still needs to be tensioned. But for right now, what we're gonna do, just to make sure we don't pull everything, pull the, uh, the, the end here back out as we're tensioning it, we're just gonna wrap it around and tie this end off to the end where we started. Uh, nothing complicated again, just to make sure it stays put while we tension the bed. Now, in later centuries, you will see a tool called a bed key, uh, which actually allows you to uh, essentially use, use uh, a, a torque to, tw to twist it to really yank every bit of, of tension out of these ropes. Uh, but they're not around just yet in this period. What you're most commonly going to see is a bed stave. This is very crude, just sort of knock together one. You'll see some that are quite refined, quite finished. Uh, but really what you need, all you need it, uh, it, it to be is a wooden pry bar, something to allow you to get into these loops of rope on the outside of the bed and haul them tight. Now, this is something that would ideally be done with two people. So you've got one person holding the tension that you've just gained, the slack that you've just gained on one side, while well, the next person pulls it through to the next, because of course we're going to have to work through the entire course of the rope, pulling it tight as we go. Uh, can be done with one person, but it'd be faster and more effective with two. And obviously that would have been the case for roping the bed as well. Working together with a family member or a servant or what have you, uh, rather than having to constantly circle the bed and, and, and that sort of thing, obviously much more uh, efficient, much faster. Uh, but as you can see, can be done with one. So you can see how much tension, how much slack that we've gotten uh, out of this bed. And again, that's just with one person with one bed stave, obviously going to be more effective with two, so you maintain even more tension as you go. Uh, but we've gotten a whole other foot, foot and a half of slack out of this entire bed. It's going to be a lot more comfortable to sleep on uh, with a little bit better support. So now, I'm really going to uh, tie this off tightly 
back here behind the headboard to make certain that we don't lose that progress that we've just made. Now, of course, natural fiber, I mean any rope, but especially natural fiber rope is going to stretch over time. And so this is something, uh, regular maintenance essentially, that would have to be done. But unless the line actually breaks, you shouldn't have to be re-roping the entire bed with any frequency, just occasionally pulling some slack out of the lines. Now, now that we've got the bed itself ready to go, let's get some bedding. When we look at the actual bedding of the time period, there's a lot of variation. There's also a lot of things that are fairly standard. So what we're going to start with here uh, is what a lot of folks in the period would refer to as a straw mat uh, or mattress or um, you know, a bed even by itself, what have you. But it's just a canvas bag, essentially. In this case, stuffed with straw. Um, which, of course, would have been very common in England. As you're farming a tremendous amount of wheat, straw is going to be easy to come by. Probably not as common in Jamestown in the early years before they start having success farming wheat, but it can be stuffed with all manner of things. And for a lot of the more comfortable beds, higher-end beds of the upper classes, this would be your base layer, which would then be topped with a flock bed. Think kind of like a futon mattress. Um, stuffed with dense, uh, uh, you know, wool batting often. Um, and then if you've got a lot of money, you might see that replaced by, or again, stacked uh, on yet another layer, a down mattress. Um, so you may be looking at uh, potentially three layers of bedding that you're on top of, on top of that rope suspension. Now, here we're going pretty basic. We're just doing the straw, uh, the straw mat, the straw stuffed mattress, um, and that's something we have specific reference to uh, from uh, our friend Captain John Smith. Uh, he specifies amongst the many things that a colonist should bring to Virginia uh, the volume of canvas that is to be made available uh, to make a bed for two men, and so you're looking at well, enough canvas to make a a two-person sized bed. In addition to the mattress itself, of course, we've got our sheets. And when we start getting into the actual bed clothes, not a lot's changed over the centuries. You've got a bottom sheet to keep your body off the mattress, and then a top sheet to keep your body off the blanket. The sheets, of course, uh, linen or linen canvas, which are going to be pretty easily launderable. Now, of course, no fitted sheet in this time period, no elastic band in your sheet to keep it put on the mattress. So when we talk making the bed in the morning, you know, after sleeping in it, rolling around at night, it's going to be a lot more complicated than just, you know, flipping the covers back up and smoothing it down. You may have to completely remake all the all the bed clothes. Now here we've got our bottom sheet and our top sheet. And you can see the seam up the middle of the seat, uh, up the middle of the sheet there. Most looms in this time period are not making particularly broad swaths of cloth. And so this would have been uh, a common work for a seamster or a seamstress piecing together yards of fabric to create linens, sheets, and tablecloths, and that sort of thing. And we've got our sheets on. We'll go ahead and throw a, a wool blanket on as well. Of course, uh, that's going to be a pretty common possession at the time. Wool is one of England's, wool and textiles, one of England's primary exports. 
Uh, so a, a, a wool blanket's definitely not going to be something uh, that's going to be hard to come by for, for most Englishmen in this time period. We've got, in this case, a pair of pillows, actual down pillows, so a little bit nicer bedding here. Could just as easily have been a bolster or commonly uh, bolster and pillows. Um, again, it's just kind of depends on personal preference and um, your economic wherewithal, much like today. And to top it off, since it is a little chilly this morning, we're going to throw a rug on the bed as well. What the English will commonly refer to as an Irish rug at the time, we can see it is actually a woven textile that has been essentially thrummed to give it this woolly appearance and of course makes it exceedingly warm. Uh, the uh, list that John Smith provides for, uh, you know, again, his recommendations for colonists includes, in amongst his bedding, a coarse rug. I don't know if this is coarse enough for Smith's tastes, but uh, definitely going to keep you warm in the winter. But there's the basics of a bed, English bed in 17th century, and uh, certainly what at least a few of the colonists here at Jamestown would have been sleeping on. So thanks for uh, tuning in today. If you enjoyed this video, let us know. Uh, like and share and subscribe. And again, by all means, please uh, leave us questions, comments below. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks for tuning in today, and we'll see you next time. Is that chamber pot on your side? Well, yeah. Well, damn. are you wearing your shoes in bed? Well, I didn't want to take them off. Oh, jeez. In case I had to get up again. Quit hogging the covers. <laughs>